So the coefficient of variation is this idea that uh, that kind of relates how much variance to the value of the mean. Kind of puts a scale to it. And notice units. So the standard deviation, let, let's say we take a, a test, right? We take exam one, which um, I'm going to try to get back to you on Friday. We'll try. Um, yesterday's travel day kind of shot me in the foot. Um, so when you take a standard deviation of your test scores, what should um, what should the units on the standard deviation be? So we take the test score, you get something on the order of points, right? Yeah. What should the units on the standard deviation be? Points. What should the units on the mean be? Points, yeah, no trick questions here. So what happens when I divide something that has units of points by something else that has units of points? What happens to the points unit? They're gone. So when I multiply by a percentage, my coefficient of variation is now a percentage, right? There's this type of variation in percentage points. Pretty, pretty straightforward. All right. Let's look at one example. The, uh, the book really does make this too easy for me, and uh, that may not be the best thing in the world. See that? There we go. Um, all right. The mean of the number of sales cars over a three month period is 87, and the standard deviation is 5. The mean of the commissions is 525, and the standard deviation is 773. Compare the variation of the two. Um, look at what happens. Um, we do the coefficient of variation on sales. For three months, we do 87 with a standard deviation of 5. So do 5 out of 87 times 100, it's 5.7%. That's the type of variance that we look at on those months. So it's this idea of how much variation is occurring. When we look at dollars and cents amounts, the mean of the commission is 525, but the standard deviation is 773. When I make this comparison, I get 14.8%. So what am I doing? I'm looking at this kind of ratio out of the hole, right? Say, well, this is my standard deviation, this is my mean. Look at the ratio, this comparison on how much variation I have in proportions of the mean. It's just an idea of talking about, another way of talking about variability, variance. Two quick examples. Not hard arithmetic, is it? Good. Okay. Um, all right. Let's freeze this back out for a second. Oh, that's frozen. Apparently it was not frozen. So I uh, almost missed my flight yesterday. That would have been bad. You know, being stuck in Florida for another day. It would have been awful. Uh, what happened uh, um, yesterday, I decided to hit some P.F. Chang's before coming to the airport, right? I underestimated the fact that I would sit still on Interstate 95 for about 40 minutes of the drive to the airport. <laughs> so, that was unfortunate. Okay, I am pushing the button. Am I not? <coughs> Great, let's try it again. 
Connor, you were, what city was it called? Boca Raton. It was great. Was that Florida Atlantic? It was. It was uh, pretty wonderful. Um, so it was a math conference, which means we uh, we got to hear people talk that write the books that you guys get to use, right, in classes, uh, which is always kind of cool because some of them are like legends, right? <laughs> We watched the guy, I watched a guy yesterday named Doug West talk, and um, Dr. West is at um, Champaign-Urbana, UI. Uh, if you take a, uh, a, gra a low graduate level, a high undergraduate level algebra class, it's his book that basically the United States has used for like 25 years. I mean, the guy is like a legend, right? So I liken it to going and watching, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to say Michael Jordan, but maybe like getting to watch Scottie Pippen play, right? So he's really good. He's not like the greatest, right? Uh, but he's really cool. And it's a math conference, so we're all sleep deprived. So they have lots of coffee. So that was also excellent. Um, there's a mathematician who made the joke that um, mathematicians are machines who turn caffeine into theorems. <laughs> but it's uh, pretty awesome. The guy's name is uh, Jean-Paul Erdős. He died about two years ago, and he would collapse from exhaustion during the middle of a conference. He was like 80, so they called the ambulance, and he you know, he like rev he revived during the middle of this this conference. And they're like, just lie still. We've called the ambulance. Like during the middle of the talk, right? He was like, how long till they get here? And he, they're like, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. He's like, then give me the microphone. I'll finish. You know, so he was like on the, on the ground. They like wheeled a chalkboard over to him. And he, he was talking out of the microphone while waiting for the ambulance. The guy was just nuts. Um, apparently, he would call people like 3 or 4 in the morning to ask a question while they were like asleep. Okay. Uh, so this is for you. This is group work. Average number of days construction, workers missed per year is 11. Standard deviation is 2.3. The average number of days factory workers missed per year is 8 with a standard deviation of 1.8. Which class is more variable in terms of days missed? So, are the factory workers more variable or are, excuse me, or are the construction workers more variable? Go to it. Groups of two. Turn caffeine into the bag. So we do we do two point three over eleven times one hundred. Uh, that's uh, pretty much what it looks like. Yeah. Well, if that's your if that's your mean, right? Okay. Then if that's your standard deviation. You're going to have to go to whatever, um, whatever you know, the significant digits you kind of reprise are. Uh, notice, uh, I mean, eight days per year uh, when standard deviation one point eight, I would do tens, right? So. Somebody from row two who wants to do construction. You have to wait for 
her to be done. Did she volunteer you? Yeah, so you so there you go. That's why you I were both swimming. <laughs> They are all about some standard deviation. So if you want to go to graduate school, <laughs> hey, Knox, we'll talk about whenever you, whenever it's all done, because you need your you know your score because it's electronic, right? Except for the written part, that'll come back in like three months. <laughs> All right. Does everyone agree with uh, their work? Okay, so then what's the conclusion? Which one is more variable? Factory workers, right? There's a 22.5% variability versus a 20.9% variability. So, um, thank you, Shanae. Thank you, Tim. Um, they're more variable. Now, I have to admit, uh, I can understand why. Have you ever worked in a factory? There is no happiness found in a the factory. There is, uh, there is labor, and there is depression, and oppression. Um, and at least as a construction worker, you're outside, you're kind of creating things. It's a little bit more freeform. <coughs> Um, I would imagine, um, for all the psychologists in the room, if you were to do profiles on people that are happier, you may not be much happier, but I bet construction work would be happier in general. Um, yeah, factory work, absolutely frightening. Okay, um, so that's pretty much section 3.2. So what have we talked about? We've talked about measures of variation. We've talked about... The variance, the standard deviation, we've talked about the range, and now we've talked about the coefficient of variation. We've even talked about standard deviation and frequency distributions. Pretty neat. Oh, and we did a, a smarter way to do the standard deviation, right? One that doesn't involve rounding error. Great, great, great. So now let's talk about measures of position, because this is uh, pretty intriguing, and we'll do some examples of this in just a little bit. Um, we talk about a z-score. Now, the name doesn't make a whole lot of sense until we get uh, a little bit farther ahead. Why are we calling it a z-score? Well, it's got a relationship to the normal distribution. And we're going to presume that when we have these numbers, our mean and our standard deviation are normally distributed. That's the idea. So a z-score or a standard score is really easy to compute. This is the uh, a value minus the mean or the expected value divided by the standard deviation. Now, so let's think about this in numbers. What would you expect the average score on exam one to be? 72. Okay, let's say, so, so Jalen says 72 here. Um, let's say I'm making 82, right? So I'm 10 points up, and let's say that the standard deviation is 6, okay? So I'm 10 points up. So 10 mi 82 minus 72 is 10 divided by 6, right? It's 1.4-ish. It's 1.1-ish, 1.12-ish, something like that. So, but it's positive, right? It's positive. And so what the z-score is going to start relating you to is position greater or less than the mean. Okay, some kind of a ratio of greatness. Uh, 
in terms of mean. So let's say though that you uh, you just take the exam, right? You went in there and you remember to write your name. Um, you could count some things. It's pretty easy to find the median, right? So you're like, uh, but I don't remember anything else. And you know, by the grace of Dr. Ensberger, you get like a 30. Okay. So let's say you get a 30, but the mean is is still 72. So I've got 30 minus 72. What's the sign on that? Negative. It's a negative number, right? And in fact, when I have 30 minus 72, I've got negative 42 divided by 6, I've got negative 7. Not only is it negative, right? If we're doing this kind of idea of scale in terms of how far away, how close you are, with 0 being really being the same as the mean, right? Positive numbers increasing kind of linearly. Well, negative 7 is way out there. Right? Negative 7 is way out there. So where are you positioned in terms of the mean? Well, if you're positive, you're better than the mean, right? That's your z-score. If you're negative, well, you didn't do as well as the mean. Okay? So maybe what I'll do is I'll give you a quiz on the day that I hand back your exam. Right? And I'll tell you the mean, the standard deviation, and I'll give you a z-score. Can you back your test grade out of the z-score? If I tell you a z-score, the mean and the standard deviation, right? Like I give you a z-score rather than, right, than, than a point score. Can you back your score out? I hope so, right? That's just simple algebra and we all are supposedly past college algebra to be here, right? Okay. So, you could back that out. Well, if I give you the mean and the standard deviation, heck, I could, uh, I could tell you, ask you what the c barrier is, right? The coefficient of variation. I can, I can start building all these things out, can't I? So what you've got is a handful of pieces of information that really describe um, values about the mean. How much change? How, how much better or worse than you, did you do? Those things are pretty darn important. So let's do an example. Um, let's say that a student does a 65 on a calc test that has a mean of 50. Have you ever taken calculus? If you've ever taken calculus, you know that a mean of 50 may not be that, uh, that far off base. Um, a 65 on a calculus test that had a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. Um, she scores 30 on a history test with a mean of 25. I don't know who you're taking for history, if that's the case. That's pretty brutal. You don't want to bail. <laughs> and the standard crush field, does somebody say that? Whoa! And a standard deviation of five. Um, I heard about where that came from. I'll, I'll cross-reference that with her later today. Um, compare her relative position on the two tests. Well, let's look at the z-scores. So 65 for, with, a, with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. So I do 65 minus 50 divided by 10. Her z-score is a one and a half. Okay, her history, the z-score is z, which is 30 minus 25 by 5. So we have 5 by 5, which is 1. So what this is, it's a relative position amongst classmen, right? So in her example where she does a z-score of 1.5, she does better, right, in terms of the class than in the class where she makes a 30 with a mean 25. Does that make sense? She's, she does better in the pack than her classmates for the history school, for the history class. You see what this is trying to get at? Now, what we're going to do in some of the up and coming sections is we're going to use this idea of a z-score to talk about really how well you've done. And we're going to back out some values out of it. But for now, we're looking at the idea of the z-score as a relative position to the class or to whatever you're measuring. Pretty important. But the z-score for the calculus class is larger, her position in the class is better, right, in general, in general. Um, and, and it makes great sense. I can't have a really small standard deviation to blow up, um, to just blow up, you know, the z-score. If I have a really small standard deviation and she does better than the standard deviation, then that's saying, hey, she really did awesome, right? So, I mean, if the z-score is large, exceptionally large, I mean, the person did well. And that's what you should know. So when uh, 
let's say I hand back that exam with your z-score and not a test score, right? Because it's a stats class. We can do things like that. Uh, I kind of like that, actually. It's intriguing. Uh, so when we do that, um, you've got a comparative tool, right? You're not just sitting around asking everyone in the class, hey, what did you do? You know, what, what test grade did you make? You're like, I've got a Z-score of a three. Dang, that rocked this, right? That means nothing to anybody else, but it means something to you. Get it? On the other hand, if you get a Z-score of a negative three, that may be one of the tests that you kind of crease in half and stick in your binder and <laughs> go cry quietly in your, in your room by yourself later. So, um, you kind of feel the hurt. So, um, the Z-score is this really neat idea, this really great comparative tool. Now, another wonderful discussion is percentiles. You take an SAT or an ACT, right? No, I'm just taking the GRE now. So, uh, how many others of you have taken the GRE? All right, a couple of you. Um, any of you, uh, any of you like senior nursing majors? So nobody's taken the NCLEX. You took the NCAT. Okay, so. You, so you guys are living right now in percentile numbers, right? Um, let's talk about what it means to be a percentile. So you've got all the performances of all the people, right? You take the SAT. Hundreds of thousands of high schoolers every year take the SAT, right? So you've got this huge data pool. And what you do is you divide the data set basically into 100 equal groups. Size is 100, right? I mean, you divide all the numbers into equal 100. And what you do is you say, well, the peak percentile, well, it belongs in the peak group. Does that make sense? So it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody who just went in the SAT, you get like a 200 for signing your name, right? Is it 200, 210, 200? Something like that, right? So, I mean, there's somebody down there who's got a 200 because they just signed their name. Right. Um, actually, the SAT is one of those exams that penalizes on wrong scores, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could like intentionally choose the wrong answers, and I think you get a negative score pretty easily. Uh, or maybe they just truncate the year, I don't know. But, so, there are people that are zero, people that are 200, and then all the way up. Are there lots and lots of people that score 1,500 or above? About too many. If you know some, you know one of a rare few. Um, there are more people that score above a 1,400, but not as not as many, right? And more people that score above a 13 to 12, you're, you're getting excessively larger groups. But what's happened is you've got this idea of a percentile, which means you've done better than all the people before you, right? If you're in the 75th percentile, so we've taken all of our scores, we've sorted them and ordered them, if you're in the 75th percentile, <coughs> you've done better than everyone this entire group less, right? That doesn't mean that you got 75% of the problems on the SAT right. It means you did better than 75% of the other people taking the test numerically. So let me give you an example. I've got a cousin who went to law school at Vandy, took the LSAT, rocked it, 98%. Ooh, wow, man, you broke it. Smart guy. Well, he was. He's an alcoholic, so he's probably killed most of the smart. Um, <laughs> you get a chuckle out of that. Bull, if you're listening, one day, laugh. Um, so uh, he's actually a really great guy. He's one of these guys. Did you say his name is Bull? His nickname is Bull. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, all, like, I'm, the, I'm the tall guy in the Ernstberger family, except for my cousin, right? He stands about 6'4", about 300. Wow. He's a big boy. Um, and he, uh, you guys watch Duck Dynasty? He's, he's an attorney, right? He's an attorney and stands about 6'4", 300, and he's got a beard out to here. And when he's not, when he's not in the courtroom, he's spitting. So, uh, he's a, he's a He's a good guy, you know. He's one of those. He's one of those family members that you want to have that you're like, you know, accidentally, you know, 
did something I'm not supposed to do, and he'll be like, say no more, I'll bring the shovels. You know, <laughs> he's one of those family members. He's a great guy. Well, uh, so when he made this wonderful score on the LSAT, right? Rocked it. You could go anywhere he wanted to go. And he's trying to tell, tell my uncle, who, you know, is, he doesn't understand this idea of a percentile. He's like, Dad, I got in the 98th percentile. And uh, my uncle's like, so that means you did really well? He's like, I did really well. And he's like, well, how well did you do? And, he, and my cousin says, I could fit all the people you know, that did better than me in the back of the truck. And he's like, in the state of Kentucky? And he's like, no, in the country, right? I mean, because what you've got to realize is so few people get up to that end that that's, I mean, that's a really high score. And so you've got this idea of how many people did you beat, right, in terms of the number of people who took it. Um, one, of the, one of the wonderful stories, which I love, I feel like I've related this to one of my classes this semester because I doubt I'm in class this is. Did we talk about the weights of babies in here? Yeah. Great. The 15th percentile is average, right? That means that, all, that if you're in the 15th percentile, about half the babies are bigger than that baby, and about half the babies are less than that baby. Or, or smaller than that baby, right? So it's not a how well are you doing, it's a where do you lie in pack. 50th percentile is dead on average. Anything less than the 50th percentile is smaller than average. Anything bigger than the 50th percentile is bigger than average, right? My Lucas came out and was ginormous on every scale. Um, you know, 98, 95th, just a huge baby. My Andrew was born, and you know, there were some things about him. He was in the 70th percentile, some things he was in the 40th percentile. He was like a stick, right? Skinny and long. Um, he came out with dark hair, dark skin, and my wife's blue eyes. And I was like, holy cow, this boy is going to be a lady killer. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, he turned like fair skin, blonde head, and blue eyes. And he's still, you know, he's still a good looking kid, but I was kind of hoping for like, you know, the <laughs> uh, you know, the ability to tan is highly prized, right? Uh, you, guys have, you guys have met my wife, haven't you? Um, so her maiden name is Lawler. But before, they were Irish, right? So they migrated. They were the O'Lawlers. These are people that burn under a 50-watt bulb. Uh, I mean, they're just, they're fair-skinned. They burn easily. Um, my wife is like this. Her sister is like this. Their dad is like this. And we were just thrilled at the prospect of our boys tanning. Because I tan, you know, like, a little darker. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're just thrilled at this concept. Uh, they can tan more than she can, but they still burn. I mean, pretty easily. It's so sad. It's heartbreaking to see these little red boys running at the beach. You're like, oh, we're going to get some more sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> and we've stopped using 30 SPF. We just moved all the way to 50. Like the sun doesn't actually touch their skin. It just is all bounced back out in the world. It's just so sad to me. Okay, so we're talking about percentiles. So um, let's talk about how we compute a percentile. So when we compute a percentile, and if you want to go look on some online examples, here are two. You're welcome to go open up the slideshow and look and click. I, I kind of want to keep the class moving because I enjoy the content. It's really neat. Um, what you do, if you want to find the percentile on where you're at, so let's say um, you know all the test scores, right? Maybe we'll do this too. <coughs> Maybe we'll do this for another class in your class, right? We'll bring in test scores from another class and talk about it. So, um, so you've got the number of values below this value. Let's say Turquoise makes an 84 on that exam, right? And that's not true. She's going to do way better. Let's say she makes an 84 on that exam, and she wants to know what percentile she is in the class. Well, what's she going to do? She's going to order all of the scores, right, and count all the ones that do worse than her, right? The number of values below her 84, she's going to add a half to it, Divide it by the total number of students. There are 25 of you, 20, 24 of you now, 24 of you. So let's say she does better than 17 other people, right? She does better than 17 other of the rest of you in the class. So she takes 17, adds a half, divides it by 24, and multiplies by 100. 
This gives a number, right? So with 17 below, adding a half divided by 24, what's 17 and a half divided by 24 times 100? 72.9. 72.9. Uh, and typically, we, we, we round up often, but she's in the 72.9th percentile, right? She is the 72.9th percentile. She's done better than 72.9 um, than in terms of raw numbers, right? In terms of head count. She's done better than almost 73% of the class, right? She didn't make a 73% on a test, but she's done better than 73% of the rest of the class. Make good sense. So this is a this is a, all these things are kind of a conversion. We're so used to thinking about performance in terms of a score, right? But that score really only serves to make us feel better about ourselves. Oh, I got a 96, great, right? Well, maybe everybody got a 97, right? So you got a 96. I mean, great score, maybe it's an easy test, but everybody did better than you, right? Now, granted, you still get the grade. It's like uh, when you take the driver's test, and then you, like you're 16, you take your driver's license test, then you talk to all your buddies about how well you did, right? So I got an 80. And all my, like, I was parallel parking. My first car was a huge Oldsmobile. And they're like, can you parallel park this there? And it was between like, you know, a, you know two cars kind of parked closely together. And, uh, uh, so it was like, uh, sure, let's give it a shot, you know, <laughs> and I hit the curve. So I got an 80. Um, and all my friends are getting like 90s, right? Did I still get a driver's license? Yeah. Yes. I'm actually a decent driver. I had any you know, car accidents. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, but I still get the driver's license. It's great. All my friends are better drivers than me, right? That's what that's saying. You take an exam, and you may you may do better than a certain amount, but this point thing, it's really kind of a weird scale. But when you convert it to percentiles, right, you know where you are in the pack. That's tough, right? The reason that the points thing that we do in classes works well because it hides how well you're doing in the class, right? We love it because you get an 83, you're like, great, I got a B. But you know, that may really not be so great in terms of how the rest of the class is doing. Um, you know, and sometimes you get a 70, and the class got a 45 on average, and you're like, woo! Yeah, you know, but your 70 still looks kind of low. The percentile tells you where you did, right? Where you are in the curve. That's important. That's a big deal. Um, Do anybody have any questions on this? No. You're all comfortable, so let's do some examples. So a teacher gives a 20-point test to 3 to 10 students. This sounds like problem solving, doesn't it? Yeah. We call it a quiz to make you not feel panicky about it. And then we like hand you a problem that involves like four to seven skills. And you've got 30 minutes on average to do it. Well. So what you do is, first off, you've got all the scores, and you have to sort them. You've got to make a data array, right? Raw data is unsorted. The data array is the data sorted in ascending order. So you've got to sort this out. Now, let's find the percentile rank of a score of 12. Okay, well, where's my 12? It's here. So I've got a 12. Great. How many numbers are there before the 12? Yeah, you can read the rest. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six numbers below the 12. So what do I do here? I add a half to six, divide it by uh, the, ten, the, the 10, and uh, of course multiply by 100. So what do we get here? We get the, six, the 65th percentile. So that 12, is the 65th percentile, right? You're kind of at the top of the heap, the bottom 65. 
That's one way of looking at it, right? So a student whose score was better than 12 did better than 65% of the class in terms of head count. This is a really useful number. Um, this whole idea is really, really useful. Are you okay with this idea? Making good sense? I mean, and this is why we keep those numbers kind of quiet, right? Somebody asks you how you that how you did on the ACT. So you got a 27, right? What does that mean? Well, you're pretty smart, right? Well, good, right? Um, what percentile is that? I don't know, right? The upper 20s must be pretty smart. <laughs> Um, somebody tells you they got a, you know, a, 30, a 36 on the ACT. They are smart, right? Period. Where are they at? They're in the 99th percentile because 99% of the rest of the class does worse than, you cannot be in the 100th percentile, right? Because that means that 100% of everyone did worse than you. If you got a 36, I can promise you somebody else got a 36 too, right? There are at least two 36s <laughs> in the entire country. Um, considering it's actually in the South, basically, nobody else outside the South much uses the ACT. Um, you know, there, there are quite a few 36s um, each and every time. There are not too many 1600s um, on the SAT. There are quite a few 1500s, 1530s, things like that. Um, enough that puts you in a small group, but not an exclusive group, right? Um, the people that get, you know, 1580, 1590 on the SAT, they missed one, right? They missed the problem on the SAT. You're talking about the old score for the SAT? Yes. Yeah. Because the new one's 24, isn't it? Okay. Well, so you get a 2390, right? You missed the problem on the SAT. That's pretty freaking small. Uh, yeah, I guess now the 1600 isn't quite as impressive. Back in my day, that was just bad. Anyway, um, so, um, but you know, the, the ACT hasn't changed, right? It's still out of 36. Good. It's your guy in ACT. So, um, so let's go back the other way. What, what value will give me will give me a certain percentile? What score do I need to make to be in the 75th percentile? All right. Well, again, you've got to do the data arranging in, in order from lowest highest, in ascending order. If you haven't figured this out yet, when I hand you a test and there's a data set that has jumbled numbers on it, it's probably a pretty good bet that you've got to sort the data. Right? This is just pretty kitty. So you sort the data, you substitute into the formula, n times p divided by 100, where n is the total number of values. There are 24 of you in here. Great. Yeah. Um, um, so you do 24 values, right? 24. And you want to find out which percentile you want to be the 75th. So you plug in 75 for P. All right. Well, that's way easier, isn't it? There's no shifting, no addition to things. Here's some rules. If it's not a whole number, round up. Right? Because we don't really talk about things being in the 72nd point nine percentile. Right? 72.9th percentile. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and if C is a whole number like 74, you automatically just tag one extra to it. Okay? Always. Automatically. Just add another one to it. Um, so we've got this idea of always moving to the next integer up. Always. So, you plug in your number, uh, total number of values, you want to find where the percentile is. So you do 75 by 100, which means 0.75, right? You're finding, a, you're finding a percentage of the numbers, and then you just always round up to the next greatest integer. Always. All right? 
So let's put it into practice, folks. So using the same scores, let's find the 60th percentile. And uh, I, I want to do this one by hand. Is that okay? Let's not just reference it on the board. All right, so using the scores in the last example, let's find the value scores to the 60th percentile and the 35th. So 60th percentile means what? What's the interpretation of the 60th percentile? Yeah, there we go. 35th percentile? You did better than the bottom 35th, 35th percent of the class, right? Mm -hmm. Do you really want to be in the 35th percentile? Okay. Let's compute it. Let's find the number that needs to be in the 60th percentile. Uh, so I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I've got 10 numbers, right? N is 10. So I've got 10. Hold on for just a second. Let's... Uh, So C, um, so C is going to be given as 10 times what value? I want to be in the 60th percentile, so I do what? You go. Times 60. Times 60 divided by 100. I even chose red. Look at that. Good job. So I've got 600 divided by 100, which is 6, which means I'm going to count the sixth one. And then I'm going to pick the one bigger than that, right? I always go to the next extra extension. Well, here's one, two, three, four, five, six, twelve. So the value corresponding to the 60th percentile is twelve. Not the 60th percent, but the 60th percentile. Well, let's do it for the 35th. Actually, why don't you do it for the 35th? Okay. Why don't you take just a few moments and do this on some paper, and I mean pretty quickly. Who's going to answer? Shanae, I heard you saying it. What's the Did I hear you saying it? Oh, I thought I heard you shout out kind of whispering answer. Six. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I've got 10 times 35 over 100. What's 10 times 35? 350. There we go. Like math rules. So I'm looking for the number that's bigger than 3.5, right? So what do I do? I round up to the fourth number. Well, that's 1, 2, 3, 4. So 6 corresponds to the 35th percentile. Well, let's do it again. Let's think about it this way. If I tell you on your exam, if I don't give you a raw score, but I tell you where you are the, as far as the percentile, is that more useful information to you? Yeah. Do you want that information necessarily? No, not at all. Yes, right. um, <clears throat> but pretty darn important nonetheless. Okay? But now here's the deal. This idea of a percentile is ridiculously useful, in fact. Um, let's keep going down to that one. Uh, another. There you go. Um, but let's relate them back to some things we've done. 50th percentile, guess what, folks? It's the median. Is there really any shocker? The median is the middle number. Well, the 50th percentile, I mean, Half is below it, half's above it. 
It's the media. Well, here's what's really cool. If you want to look at the 25th or the 75th percentile, all you've got to do is find the median of the bottom half, right? So let's say we sort all of our data out into a data array. I find the median right here, and I want to find the 25th percentile. Take all of those numbers, right? Scoot them over here off to the side. I make sure they're still in order, and I find the middle value of those. Boom. I find the median of the bottom half. 25th percentile. 25th percentile. How cool is that? For those of us who are programmers, who use Excel, who's in with this, all you have to do is find the median of the bottom half. So you find the median, you take all the values less than that. You find the median again. There are commands built into every modern programming language to do this. 75th percentile, find the median, take the values to the top half. Sort them, take the middle value again. How nice is that? Pretty darn nice. So it's the median of the values above the median or below the median. All right, folks, we've got about three minutes to go. We've got more material to cover. So um, let's take a break. See you guys later.